God never gives you a dream that matches your budget. He is not checking your bank account. He is checking your faith. A very good morning to one and all, respected dignitaries on the dais, my enthusiastic juniors with a million dreams in their eyes. I, on behalf of Sri Balaji Society, welcome Professor S. A. R. P. V. Chaturvedi, founder Sri Ramanuja Mission Trust. Her Excellency Mariela Cruz, Ambassador to India from Costa Rica. Mr. Paolo Petroselli, Cultural and Music Diplomacy Officer, Permanent Secretariat of the World Summit of Nepal Peace Laureates. Dr. Edward Muller, Founder and President of University for International Cooperation, Corporation. Mr. Rajesh Pathak, Nepal Speakers Bureau. Mr. Keshab Cholagin, Interfaith Movement Nepal and Dr. Nitin Parab, author, strategist, CEO, coach evangelist, Crosslink International, to today's seminar on cultural leadership and youth for peace management, and wish you all the very best for a great career ahead. Last but not the least, always remember to create the highest, grandest vision possible for your life, because you become what you believe. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. I would like to request Professor Dr. Colonel A. Bala Subramanian, Executive Director, BIMM, Dean, BITM, BIIB, and BIMHRD to address the gathering. I stand here to welcome Her Excellency and other dignitaries on the dais on behalf of the managing committee, all the faculty members, all the staff, and the student community. Ladies and gentlemen, I, when I was introducing the Balaji Society to Her Excellency, I said, uh, we have no holiday here. And one reaction came from her mouth just like Narendra Modi. See, see the, word, uh, the, the Prime Minister is working uh, 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 all, all, on all the days. And then, you see, uh, her, to her uh, left, that is his, her teacher in post-graduation. It so happened that they happened to meet here and all the and all the great thing we are going to learn today. Swamiji has come again, a big surprise, pleasant surprise for us, for me at least. I think with you all, I am also going to learn. I am a Fauji. I am trying to kill my enemy. But here they are going to talk about peace. That, that is quite a lot of things to learn. I once again welcome Her Excellency and the galaxy of brightest mind. And I thank them for being with us today. Good morning, one and all. On behalf of Sri Balaji Society, it is my immense privilege to introduce Professor S.A.R. Prasanna Venkatacharya Chaturvedi. I would like to invite Professor S.A.R. P.V. Chaturvedi ji to enlighten our young student managers with his words of wisdom. Exceptional experience pleases everywhere. 
for the victory. I want to emphasize that if we are understanding about being with the validation and possibility and the responsibility to make it possible, so please give us a brief introduction because I have been given the responsibility of doing the job pretty well. I am a tool setter, tone setter, tempo setter, and pen setter for these users. So I have to give a brief introduction about the same. Point number one, whenever we talk about peace, we are saying two things. I sent a few letters to some organizations, some group of activists for a discussion about peace. Then they told that we yeah, enough we had sessions on peace and we are no more interested in them. Peace sessions are just nothing but insipid time passing events. Whereas we see whenever you browse on the internet, whenever you go for a Amazon, you can see voluminous devices, critical analysis in the themes of peace. So great celebrities, rulers, diplomats, think tanks, scientists, technocrats, Corporate, all these people on the other side, they talk about peace. The lower side, peace, whenever it is exposed to students, betting generations, normal grassroots generations, whenever we expose the term peace to them, they say that no, no, it's not acceptable, it's not interesting for them. So peace simultaneously is enjoying both stardom and boredom on both these sessions. Now we want to emphasize about peace demography. Whenever you want to talk about something, to produce and distribute the same thing to a mass society, we cannot end in the fallacy of hasty generalization. In peace demography, we categorize the society into different groups. Whenever we talk about peace, just you go for a survey. How many people are pessimistic? No, we cannot obtain complete, sustainable and comprehensive peace for all. I see a lot of people, even inside your mind, you have a sleeping instinct may be dormant in nature, that complete peace may not be achievable either by this generation or immediately. That is sleeping inside. Second thing is sheer optimism. Without their responsibility, commitment and action, many people are talking about peace. That peace is easily accessible, no problem. That is sheer optimism. Third thing, many people without botheration about the fructification or accomplishment, they are blindly serving the society. They belong to enthusiast, that is activist community. So we have pessimists, we have sheer optimism, and we have enthusiastic people, those who are activists in the society. Many people, and I interview people about peace, what is your commitment? I'll be doing my duty and I won't intrude. Non-intrusion and doing my duty are the two eyes of peacemaking. If people are confined within their responsibilities, they don't bother about the extended responsibilities apart from their mere duty and non-intrusion. Many people, they are satisfied with what they are. It is a life, it is the order of life. And world is like that. People are satisfied with that. Many other people are double gamers. They are running simultaneously butcher shop as well as vegetarian congress. Many people develop arms and ammunitions. They undergo or engage themselves into war trade and boost their resources only by arms tradition and arms distribution and simultaneously running parallel sessions as well as institutions of peace. Double gamers. Few people are not like that. They are strike forward, peace killers of the society, spawn terrorists. We are seeing that. Many people are dubious about the situations. Many people are far beyond our very far beyond our discussions and deliberations. They are the distant community, the rural, tribal, the most neglected, marginalized, surprised, or trampled community of the society, those who are few with mosses. And there are also people, those who are dissatisfied about these type of deliberations. How to convince them? If you talk about global peace, if it is about your own peace, complacence, and satisfaction, it is achievable without the need of such conferences. If you talk about global, if you talk about ubiquitous, if you talk about comprehensive, if you talk about perennial peace, then you need something more than what you are doing. You need thorough peace, demographic understanding, analysis, and action. That is much. So this is the demographic. So what I want to conclude here is. Peace is accessible. Peace is accessible. Peace is experienceable. It's not only access experienceable. It is storable and transferable or transmittable to posterity. But as per phenomena, as per the ideology of the grouping, the answer is very simple. When somebody asks me, when will I reach you? Then immediately I told you tell about the time at which you are starting and the mode of your transport, then I can say clearly. Where are you coming from? Then the 
Similarly, peace can be made, but by whom? Not by simple speakers, orators and narrators. It's not the product of eloquence. It is a product of diligent service, struggle and sacrifice. Peace comes from a different category. It is composed of a different ingredient, distinct from what we are possessing and what we are planning to possess. It needs some additional spice, salt and sweetness that we have to develop. So, who is going to make it? And what do you define it as peace? How you are going to make it and how long it will take are four major questions which are lying before us. I am not going to produce answers, but I am going to kindle the spirit within my possible capacity so that we can discuss and take the long journey of peacemaking in the society. It is an instructive ceremony of a great, grand, gifted, divine voyage that we are starting now, that our predecessors have already commenced and had it over our responsibility to proceed and to make it successful. So, once again, to define peace, it needs a comprehensive definition. It needs a multilateral vision to define what is peace. What is peace? Very simply we can say, there is a hexagonal view of peace. The first thing is, security and development or prosperity are two eyes. Without prosperity, we can never be useful to us and others. Without security, prosperity is meaningless and it is nothing but a difficulty or danger in disguise. So these two things, they make peace. But not only imposing security or demand of security and prosperity in others, we should provide them proper knowledge, we should provide them support, and we should provide them opportunities. Peace can be achieved only by security and prosperity, and not some automatic emergence of security and prosperity because your role and collective responsibility. You have to provide them awareness, resources, support, motivation, and all possible means with opportunities. Opportunities to survive, opportunities to grow and establish. Peace is established in three stages according to our tradition. We used to say three stages are there. Dana Yoga Kshema. When people are in the suffering level or first phase of transition, we should have proper attention and observation on how they are prospering. At once they are settled, they should be offered protection that whatever they have acquired will be undisturbed in the society. If in case they lose anything, if there is a downfall or decline, they should be assured rescue or rehabilitation. So we have to attend to the society. We should protect the society which is well attended. We should rescue in case of loss of protection value. We should rescue them from the clutches of downfall and decline and they should be rehabilitated. It is a continuous journey. Peace is not assurance of uninterrupted happiness or joy. Peace is non-interruption, in case of interruption, providing the dynamism to fight with, in case of failure, providing the ability to resurrect, that is known as peace. So, peace is not only somebody told, you are, are you having peace? Yes, I am having peace. That does not mean that I am totally peaceful, I have to have disturbances, I have to have intrusions, but still I am having peace. How it is possible? Very simple. Peace is explained in four phases. Hope for peace, attempts for peace, Trial for peace, solid action for peace, all these are equal to experience of peace. So as in having hope of peace or hope in peace, ability to instill the same hope in others about peace, I can say that I am peaceful. Whenever you feel faith in hope or feel faith in your own mechanism of creating or generating peace, you are peaceful. So I wish that everybody should develop their hope, attempt, apart from their trial and consolidated action levels to make peace as an experience. Peace is accessible. We have our own responsibilities in this quadrilateral society. The society consists of four levels. Administrators, activist community, elite community, and elementary based community or mosque. In everybody, we need the language. Can you use your language and your tendency and approach to an elementary mass society in English? Using high grade eloquence, so we need a different language, different logic, different sense and emotion to approach these four regions of zones of the society is much essential for peace architecture in the society. And coming to the conclusion, I want to emphasize one major thing. We know about exchanges. What is the use of these academic institutions? They are broader than what it is mentioned in the prospectus. They are wider than what it is thought or contemplated by the teacher or the public society or the students. They are deeper than what education is defined or elucidated in crisis. It is something great than what we could imagine about education, campus, teaching, certification. All these things have a very great and grand perspective. The real perspective of such education is exchange. 
producing ability to exchange in the society, to expand the relations. You know about only currency exchange. Similarly, there should be some exchange, which we call it as sophisticated spiritual exchange. What is that? You have three things. One is tendency, second is potency, and third is clemency. Those who are capable of doing something, accomplishing in the society, those who need a small spark, those who need small ignition, you should exchange or you should transmit your tendency to many members of the society. Many people, you have to transfer your potency to the victims of this life. Many others, those who are not capable of doing anything, such deplorably conditioned people, need your embrace in the form of clemency. So education is meant for making the students as accomplishers of tendency, potency and clemency exchange for embracing the broader society resulting in social benefit and global change and well-being. That is the purpose of real education. Second thing is instilling the body or the complete consciousness platform or network of the creation purpose itself. That is the purpose of real education. In your body, if something is independently growing without the cognitive command, something is independently growing, excessively growing or unwantedly growing, what do you brand it as? You won't brand it as growth even though something is growing. It is designated as tumor. It is designated as cyst. It is also branded as cancer. It is also called as information. That's what it is happening in the society. In the pretext of so-called growth and prosperity, beautified formats of scars, cysts, tumors, cancers, inflammations are being nourished in the society, are glorified in the society. So education is a process by which a person can understand that he is a particle of, in your body, everything is organized by a common cognitive command. Similarly, global consciousness, understanding that every part of the world, every phase of transition, every denizen or brother or fellow being of yourself is a part of you by means of non-intrusion, by means of support, contribution and munificence you have to embrace the society with all possible means, giving that broad-mindedness or superior magnanimity is the purpose of education. One more interesting thing, I want to quote about education and the role of teachers which I have been discussing yesterday in the school also. We have TQ, we used to call it as TQ, teachers, textbooks and technology. Textbook can provide you the stuff, essential stuff by which you can develop yourself. Technology will be everything, everything the technology can provide so that you can augment your development. But the teacher can only provide you that vision and mission so that this augmented development is distributed, directed and dedicated to the needy masses of the society. That is something which textbooks and technology could not or cannot provide that is provided by teachers. That is the greatness of teachers. Second is youth engagement. Today we have named the seminar as youth engagement seminar in peace management. Just simply I want to put many people in three phases of transition. I used to call it as youth transition phases. As kids, as boys and as grown youth, they are under the control, custodianship and stewardship or direction of only teachers. Kids in the elementary school and in the colleges we have grown up mature youth and all the other boys are there in the high and higher secondary levels. And to brief uh, all the seeds, the sprouts and saplings of youth, they are all under the constructive supervision and efficient management of the teacher community beyond the syllabus. Within their spiritual ambit, anything that they contribute will make these seeds, sprout and saplings to establish themselves as great balance of the society, supporting billions of mosques. That is the greatness of educated community. Apart from the curriculum designing, curriculum designing and career building, we should also concentrate more effectively on everlasting effect on character designing and compatibility and capability building with every person of the society. So, I wish that this great assembly will take more initiatives to develop leadership in culture. We talk about cultural leadership. What is culture? Just in one statement we can say as per our tradition, it is known as Bhartana Vastu Nyaya in Sanskrit. Plate and dish, cup and beverage. We know only about the cup and plate, we don't know about the dish and beverage in culture. What is really culture? That which can trigger human senses inside the listener or appreciator is known as culture. There are three human senses. In the marginal human level, it creates courtesy about others. In the second level, progressive level, it creates concern about others. In the well-developed or mature level, it creates compassion about others. 
concern embraces many number of people, compassion guides the entire universal network, and concern benefits our own surroundings. And to create something, we need a tool that is known as culture. Culture should create not relaxation and entertainment in the performers and listeners. It should instill solace, peace and progress in every particle of the world, wherever they go, wherever they mingle with. That is known as culture. So I always used to say, if music, dance, literature, language, poetry, whatever you call it as, all these things are nothing but plates and cups. And the beverage and dishes inside is nothing but creating courtesy, concern, compassion, solace, peace, all these things are the inner ingredients. Now, in the context of culture, we see only the confines. She confines they rule the society without having the contents inside. I wish that culture should be revisited, which I also hinted in my yesterday's deliberation. And once again, cultural leadership requires a lot of qualities. You know that he went to a doctor, he's a qualified doctor, but he told that I am not a super specialist. To take this operation, to make it successful, I need to be a super specialist. Similarly, mere cultural artist, artist, tourist and commercialist cannot become cultural transformers or ambassadors. It needs a super specialist. I'm talking about Beethoven. You can play the tune of Beethoven in your own piano. Can you replicate the substance, the spirit and soul of Beethoven unless you are immersed in his personal nature, in his spiritual nature? Now you can imitate anything using technology or using your memory and expertise, but few things are irreplicable. They are known as spirit. They are known as commitment. They are known as verb and velocity of greatest findings of our transcendental vision cannot be imitated. We need to create a new cultural dynasty. Coming to the final point of today's introductory lecture, whenever you talk about leadership, it needs some qualities. Qualities of perseverance, faith, endurance and sacrifice are much essential. How to obtain these things? By means of your innermost pursuit. If you want to see the last member of your society, you should be knowing about the first member, that is your soul. The deep you go inside, that is known as yoga. What is yoga? Yoga is nothing but an art by which a person can see his innermost self. They are talking about goals. There is only one goal for every human being to create peace and establish peace in the society and all other things are just preparatory costs for making the same. That's why I told in a seminar of yoga, yoga means why was GA your only goal assigned to see your innermost realization by means of which you can benefit masses, maximized and most perennialized benefit that you can do for the society. In yours, the change you can bring in others and get it to all, that is also yoga. Why was GA? The change in you that you bring in others also, creating a gateway to all is known as why was GA yoga. So let us all think about the innermost appreciation, what you are in the innermost by means of your cogitation. There was a seminar on cogitation. All scientists and great thinkers, they have meditated, but that is unorganized. Yoga is a system of organized deep meditation in which you can know about your own self and everything that you see. Peripheral and ephemeral vision has produced innumerable technologies and methodologies which are failure, which have resulted in futility and adversity. To create sustainability in the society, it could emerge only from a totalitarian or composite vision that is possible by utmost compassion and introspective meditation. There are three angles of spirituality. One is having a specific God and being under them. Second is having a God who is unspecific and ubiquitous or all pervading. Let us leave these two spiritualities. The third spirituality is to see spirit in everything, in every action and every particle to see spirit. In others, forever, eternally, we are always seeing the spirit inside. I wish that this spirituality as a global commitment, as an individual's complete personality development program, this should be included in the curriculum. God specific or ubiquitous God related philosophical spirituality can be neglected or can be deprioritized or can be taught later or externally. But inside the curriculum, there need to be a super curricular designing of a person's viewing his own inner self by means of which he can have a broader view about the entire universe. Universal view can be accomplished only by the deepest view of the smallest individual. I totally congratulate this laudable mission that we have taken to elaborate this ceremony here. And I wish all the participants, organizers, facilitators and supporters a great grand success in 
not only in today's listening or audition, in their own life by their application and by repointing the same thing every day in every walk of life. Once again, blessing, wishing and praying for all of your welfare. I take leave, Narayan Narayan. I would like to call on Dai's student manager, Alvin David Jaipal, to introduce our guest of honor, Her Excellency, Mariela Cruz, Ambassador to India from Costa Rica, to all the budding student managers. Yoga does not change the way we see things. It transforms the person who sees. Good morning, everyone. Today, we have one such enlightened mind amongst us. The Ambassador to India from Costa Rica, Her Excellency, Mariela Cruz Alvarez, who is an authorized grade two yoga instructor from the Krishna Patabi Jose Ashtanga Yoga Institute in Mysore. Madam has devoted 15 years of her life mastering the art and science of yoga and is the first Central American to receive the blessings of her teacher to teach the classic Ashtanga yoga. By profession, she is also a lawyer with a master's degree in environment law and postgraduate in commercial and family law. Madam has been an environmental legal advisor for the national company for power and electricity in the project for the recovery of the Rilla River's upper basin. Between the years 1993 and 1995, she has fought for the intellectual property cases for the law firms Shaveria and Gonzalez and Carbella and Soli. She has been the Attorney General of the Republic of Costa Rica and also the General Directions of Civil Aviation of Costa Rica. Her Excellency is well versed with four languages, Spanish, French, Italian and English. Madam is also a research scholar with several published theses related to legal issues and numerous national and international publications on Ashtanga Yoga. Apart from these scholarly achievements, she is also a classical pianist taught by Miss Maria Clara Kulel at Conservatory of University of Costa Rica. Madam, we are honored to have you amongst us. Now, I would like to welcome Her Excellency Mariela Cruz Alvarez to share some of her wisdom with us in our budding student managers. Thank you. I will invite you to close your eyes, please. Go within. Shh, quiet. Close your eyes, feel your breath, and be here now. Okay, when I tell you, you can open your eyes, not yet. Just take three big breaths, expand your lungs. Open your mind and be here with me. Choose to be here with me. Close your eyes, please. Close your eyes. Yeah, you close your eyes, too. <laughs> All the members in the table, please close your eyes, too. Yeah, take a big breath. Relax the body. Let go of the cell phone. <laughs> and please listen to me. So I thank you so much for presenting me, introducing me, but you missed something that's crucial in my life. I am the mother of seven children, six boys and one girl. And the happy grandmother of a four-month-old baby. He was born just before I came to India. So motherhood defines my life beyond everything else. That's been my yoga. How to pursue my own personal dreams and at the same time raise my family with love and care and be present for them and show them an example. Okay. And the 
table, please you can turn around so you can watch the video. You can open your eyes now. The nature that shapes who you are. Who am I? I am an alluring concentration of beauty, rainforests, beaches, and biodiversity. I live in the heart of the Americas, guarded by two seas. I am the deep green that entices those seeking relaxation and adventure. And I am so much more. In my essence live the warmth and authenticity of my people. People with open arms who look forward towards the future and welcome opportunities. I am a unique, happy and caring nation that expresses itself through the diversity of its cultures. I am cradle of human talent, proud people who embrace challenges. I am a nation governed in peace with a solid, long-standing democracy. I stand behind health, education, and the pursuit of self-development as the cornerstones of happiness. In my essence lie the preservation and care for the environment, a model to the world. I breathe the riches of my land, and I recognize the wit of my people ever capable of giving more than expected. I am a trustworthy and reliable nation, distinguished by the value of what I create. Human development, innovation, and a proven international competitiveness set me apart and enable me to export quality to the world. Those who come to know me are surprised, amazed. My greatest aspirations can be found in my concentrated essence. I am a country that attracts those who seek the value of excellence and the commitment to sustainability. I have much to offer those wishing to purchase, invest, produce, and develop. I have the required human and technological capabilities to achieve this. I rediscover myself by searching within. I find myself in what is vital, in what is true. I rediscover what is important. I am green. I am happiness. I am solidarity. I am talent. I am innovation. I am quality. I am diversity. I am concentration. I am essential Costa Rica. Please repeat with me, pura vida, pura vida. So that's how we greet each other in Costa Rica. Pura vida means pure life, means I am happy to be here. I am happy to represent my country. I am so happy to have two of my Costa Rican friends here, Edward, Antonio. And I am very happy to meet you all. And uh, when I was preparing my speech for this morning, I was thinking of you as one of my kids, because I have kids your age. I have children from six-year-old until 27-year-old. <laughs> All the colors and shapes and sizes. And new generations really uh, move my heart. And uh, it's because of new generations that I am here posted in India. And I am following my, my dreams. And it's my big honor and pleasure and blessing to have an Indian guru for 15 years. It's my blessing also to be uh, living in your land, a dream that I have uh, pursued for many years. And so when I speak to you, uh, think of me as Maybe someone who has humbly followed her heart in her life. And so you can have a context of that. So uh, someone told me once that your energy introduces you before you actually speak. And uh, the vibration that we can offer in each of our interactions and in the interaction with the world, that is what re is really important for peace. If we have peace in our heart, if we have peace in our minds, then we can create peace 
around us, in our relationships, in our communities, in our countries, in the world. If we lack peace, we're going to share that. We're going to share that anguish, that despair, that uh, disconnection. And so yoga has completely transformed my life. And uh, I eagerly recommend it to everyone. Uh, I have a personal yoga practice of two hours every day. But it doesn't mean that you need to do the same. You can be a yogi and you can actually, you don't need to move a limb. You can be a yogi and I've met many of those. People who are really kind, who are really uh, open and willing to serve other people. Those are true yogis. And when we speak about yoga for peace, we speak about finding within us that connection. So I would like to start my speech with some questions. So I will ask you to please again close your eyes and relax the body and just listen to me. So I studied and I, I pursued the academic path for 33 years. And I have three uh, postgraduate, postgraduate degrees. And at 33, I realized they were not enough. Someone, something was missing in my heart. And then I started asking myself the important questions. First one, why am I here? Who am I? What is the purpose of my life? How can I stop the suffering? Where can I find peace? What is my mission in life? Where do I find true guidance? You can open your eyes now. And those questions, I cannot say that I have answered them all. I am in the process. But uh, what I know is that I felt a deep calling to your country. And traveling from Costa Rica, from my beautiful jewel, to India is, wow, it's a whole adventure. How many of you have been to America? Whoa. <laughs> How many of you have been to America? Who would like to come to Costa Rica? That's wonderful. Uh, we are small in population. We are the size of Pune, five million people. We are, but we are big in heart, <laughs> so we welcome you all. Uh, as you heard, I train in classical music since I was seven years old, and my mom was chasing me around because I didn't want to go to class. So I would climb into a mango tree and just stay there and complain. And now I thank my mom so much for giving me the gift of music. And when I started practicing yoga, yoga became my music. The only thing is that my body is the instrument, my breath, the symphony, and the way to connect to my deeper essence. And as you saw in the video, Costa Rica is small. It's an essence. It has this quality, this uh, taste, this flavor. In Sanskrit, you call it rasa. My country is a country full of natural flavors, no artificial ingredients. We are pure nature. We are oceans, volcanoes, jungle. 5% of the world's biodiversity was born there. And my country has also a, a history of peace. We don't have an army, which is pretty rare in these times of wars and convulsion. So when I speak about peace, I have a direct experience of what peace is, not only because I was gifted to be born in Costa Rica, but also because I have been 14 times to your country, to India, searching for that peace in my spirit. So I could be a better mom, so I could be a better partner, a better lawyer, and uh, basically a better human being. So if you think about music, Music is uh, it's so ingrained in our system. When we listen to music, we relax, or we get joyful, or we uh, share with friends. Uh, 
So I am actually super happy because my kids are always sharing music with me in Spotify, <laughs> sending me their new playlists. So I get to listen to a lot of music, but my favorite music is the music of silence. And when I am able to go to that place of silence, then uh, really interesting ideas start coming to me. So I am here to tell you there's two ways to live your life. One way is to think you are actually in control, which we are not. And the other way is to realize that we are always protected by a higher energy. And you can call it however you want to call it, Buddha, Krishna, love, life, prana. But actually, if we can surrender our lives to that energy, then life starts using us as an instrument. And then we start manifest, manifesting really interesting things that we would have never thought on our own. Our minds are limited, our minds are small, unless we are connected to something bigger. And my grace has been my guru's wisdom. He has shown me so much devotion. And this is in a very important book here in your country, the Bhagavad Gita. Devotion is the path of the heart. Once you find something in your life that you really love, you do anything for that, anything. You will go beyond your mind's limits. You will go beyond your capacities. And uh, when you become a parent, you will know about that love. You would do anything for your children. And also, you would do anything for your guru or your spiritual guide. So you are so lucky to have been born in this land. This land is so full of, of wisdom. The first time that I came to India in 2003, I stepped out of the airplane. And as soon as I stepped down, I felt a vibration. And that vibration has been going with me to America many, many times and coming back. And it always brings me back like a magnet. And you are born here and you live here. So I'm here to tell you, don't forget about it. Don't get so trapped in your mind that you forget that you are Indians. You are so lucky. You have great karma. I have traveled so far away <laughs> to be here. And you're actually here. I was asking one of the teachers, do you teach yoga in this uh, place? And she said that, yes, that you get some yoga. Find yoga. Find uh, something that connects you. It could be maybe you like cooking. Maybe you like sports. Maybe you like, I don't know, painting, whatever moves your heart, do that. Because really smart people are not so focused in one thing only. Um, really, uh, the brain needs to be developed in all areas. And some of us are more left brain, some of us are more right brain. But if you are able to expand your awareness in the arts, in literature, in music, besides your career, then you will be a happier human being. And then you'll do your job even better. But find inspiration wherever you can. As I said, I've traveled a little bit of your country, and I am so uh, in awe of your architecture, for example, of your temples. Lately, I have been going a lot to Brindavan. And this is actually the first time that I knew about Brindavan. And it's so sacred, that holy city. And I have found so much relief for my heart. It's, not, it's been very hard for me to be away from my family. My family is all in Costa Rica. And as I was, I was watching the video, I started crying. You know, I miss the oceans. I go there every week when I'm back home. I miss my family, my blood, my friends. And yet, I think it's an amazing opportunity because I am able to be here today and speak to you. Maybe one of you, two of you, maybe all of you want to come to my country. We have a university for peace in my country. Isn't that amazing? United Nations. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank my hosts. I want to thank uh, my friends. And I want to thank all of you. What is yoga? Yoga is the 
calming of the fluctuations of the mind. And when a m the mind is clear, then you can actually realize who you really are. Beyond this body, beyond this facade, beyond our age, be beyond our nationality. We all share a common energy. And when we realize that, then we are there for each other, to support each other, to serve each other, to serve the human cause of humanity. We share the same life. We're all going to die. Death is there for each one of us. And if we realize that, then we don't uh, get stuck in our doubts and fears. My motto in life is don't let the fear stop me, ever. So if I really feel and I pray a lot and meditate and if a decision I need to take comes, I take it. Even though it may be hard, even though it may be painful. And then I realize it was really worth it. So go beyond your fears. How do you do that? You need to be connected to something bigger. Find a teacher. Find someone that inspires you. Find someone that supports you through the obstacles. You have a very beautiful deity here, Ganesha. And Ganesha puts the obstacles in your life. So you can find your true talents. And you can realize your own, own capacities. And he's actually helping you develop your full grace. So uh, yoga is a gift from India to the world. And as we prepare to celebrate the International Yoga Day, uh, I am here to tell you, don't lose the opportunity to find that precious gift, that jewel that India has given to everyone in the whole humanity. It's such a precious, important wisdom and knowledge. And Costa Rica is open for each one of you. Costa Rica, as I said, is a very protective, protected country in the turbulence of Latin America. And since we don't hold an army, we use all those resources for education and for health. So our children are growing in a stable uh, country, and uh, we are very gifted for that, and we are willing to share that vibration with you. And I am deeply grateful for you to have me here. It's my blessing. It's my good karma. And uh, I want to thank my teacher. Uh, he's in Mysore. And he's the reason why I'm here and why I have come so many times to your country. And I will keep coming until the end. So thank you so much. And <laughs> And this morning, as I was practicing, I ran into a video. And uh, that's the last thing that I want to share with you. So listen to it. He's a very wise yogi. Is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. He can't beat death, but he can beat death in life. And the more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. There are ways out. There is a light somewhere. If you are going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If you are going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe your mind. Go all the way. It could mean not eating for three or four days. It could mean freezing on a park bench. It could mean jail. It could mean derision, mockery, isolation. Isolation is the gift. All the others are a test of your endurance, of how much you really want to do it. And you'll do it, despite rejection and the worst odds. And it will be better than anything else you can imagine. If you're going to try, go all the way. There is no other feeling like that. You will be alone with the gods, and the nights will flame with fire. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. All the
the way. All the way. You will ride life straight to perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is. Thank you, madam, for enlightening the budding student managers with a word of wisdom. Now, I would like to call on Dias, student manager, Utkarsha Levi, to introduce our honorable guest, Mr. Paolo Petrosoli, permanent cultural and music diplomacy officer. Good afternoon, one and all. Changing the world takes more than everything any person knows, but not more than we know together. We have such leader among us who has always dedicated his efforts in taking everyone together to change this world. Mr. Paolo Petroselli is a cultural entrepreneur driven by the belief that the arts and arts education are a major force for growth, development, and change globally. A passionate, innovative, and dynamic manager with extensive experience in leadership position in a variety of organizational settings. He is an international relation and global cultural affair expert. In order to serve as an active citizen and support nonprofit activity, he has become a leading member of some of the most prestigious international organization, including United Nations, UNESCO, World Economic Forum. He served as cultural and music diplomacy officer for the permanent secretary of the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates. And he is the co-founder and president of Youth Committee of Italian National Commission for UNESCO. As a music diplomacy ambassador, he served an institutional role to forge bond through music in Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the US. Sir is the founder and president of Emma for Peace, Sir, serve on numerous board of directors, visiting fellow at Yale University, visiting researcher at MIT Media Lab, director of Master of Cultural Management at Rome Business School, and a TEDx speaker. Sir, hold an MA in Violin Performance for Conservatory of Santa Cecilia and gra graduate in Musicology of both the La Sapienza University of Rome and Middlesex University of London. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in economics, marketing, and creativity at IULM University in Milan. Now, I would like to call upon Mr. Paolo Petroselli to take the dais and enlighten us all with his precious word. President, Her Excellency, Prof. Swami, speakers, dear students, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. I'm so pleased to be here with you. I come all the way from, from Italy, from Rome. Uh, this is my first time in India. I'm so inspired by this visit. <laughs> It's going to be difficult, of course, after these beautiful words of the ambassador to add something more interesting to this morning. I will try to just simply to tell you my story. Um, I was sitting there and was so amazed by how you guys look great uh, in the audience. Uh, and, and I was looking at your eyes. And I actually seen these eyes many other places of the world, and also in Italy. We look at the world like you guys are looking this morning, with, with hope, with courage, with determination. Uh, I really feel this energy here is in this audience. And I want you to know that we share the same energy also in Italy, in Rome. Uh, as you know, Italy, like India, is a country with a lot of history, traditions, culture. Uh, we respect and we admire so much India in Italy. Um, we read a lot about, Italy, about India. Uh, I have a lot of good friends from India living in Italy. Most of them are uh, researchers, uh, students, musicians, and uh, 
we actually started, uh, of course, with some of them uh, collaborating together, working together. Some of them became friends of mine. We share also the same level of responsibility to actually project these traditions, the history, the culture of our countries in the future. You feel the weight of this responsibility? I feel it every day in my country. Uh, and I know that we also share the same challenges. You know, the challenges that we want to fight to make our country become a better place. Um, so, how can we make it? You know, I've been playing the violin for 20 years. I'm still, still young, not like you guys. Uh, but, yeah, I've been playing the violin for 20 years. And then, you know, I was feeling something happening. Uh, when you are so close to music, to art, uh, every day of your life, you experience every day certain kind of emotions. And it's not so easy, of course, every day to just immerse yourself into these kind of emotions. Sometimes the result is that you become quite distant from reality, right? You know, you know how artists are, right? I, I create beauty, I make music, don't disturb me, I have to do something beautiful. You know, I don't have to interact with the noise, uh, with the distractions from outside. So sometimes artists just forget about reality. And this is the worst thing, actually, that could happen to, to an artist, to a musician. So while I was feeling that I was actually going to be a little bit distant from reality, at the same time, I also discovered a special power inside me which was not related you know, to technical skills or to music, to art anymore. I was realizing that I was playing a role in my community, in my city, uh, in my society. You know, I was a musician, so someone gave me a title and I became a musician. That was my head. So what a musician does? A musician, uh, usually they play concert, they meet people, uh, like in a beautiful auditorium like this one, and they play music for the others, hopefully, for themselves for sure. This is, you know, not so interesting anymore. Uh, you know, I've been playing and practicing hours and hours and hours just to meet audience for one hour. What's, what's the point, you know? Why? I can use actually these this skills much, you know, in a, in a broader way. And, and of course, that was the change of, of vision that happened in my mind when I was around 20. I said, well, look, my role is not just to play in an orchestra, play as a soloist in concert hall in theaters. Maybe I can use these skills in another way to make an impact, hopefully a positive impact in my community in a different way. So I started exploring other kind of experiences. Uh, and that's why I uh, gradually started playing less, less and less because I wanted to make other kind of experiences, other kind of studies, uh, challenge myself in a different way. So I started become, we can define, I became a, a manager in cultural. Uh, so I started going on the other side, not anymore on the stage, but backstage. I wanted to feel the experience of organizing something, promoting something, designing a project. After that, I felt the need to do something more. Uh, so I started collaborating with organizations that were not strictly connected to music, to culture. Uh, because I wanted to be, I wanted to find a way to be of support, even if I'm a violinist. You know, usually when you go, especially meeting politicians or, you know, representative of institutions, they say, okay, you are a musician, but then what do you do in your life? No, like musician is not being, playing music is not being, then what do you do in your real life to uh, survive, to earn money? Uh, so this paradigm, actually, I wanted to change this paradigm. Like, you know, I'm a musician, I can survive with music, and actually I can be of support to you. In which way? Well, let's, let's see, let's understand in which way. To make it short, this is, music diplomacy, cultural diplomacy. How actually artists, musicians can use their skills to make an impact outside concert halls, outside museums, art galleries, and so on. Why? 
music has the ability, art has the ability to build support to the, social, the, the, the society. Because music, for instance, is a universal language. If now, guys, I start talking in my own language, Italian, you will not understand me. Se adesso parlo in italiano, nessuno di voi mi capisce più. E potrei parlare per dieci minuti e voi non mi capite. Right? You see how it's easy <laughs> to lose, you know, control of understanding. We, we feel always so comfortable, right? Especially as young people, because we have access to everything uh, through technology, social media. We, we feel that we know everything. We know very little about each other. And if we don't use the same language, we are lost, completely lost. You know, you, I believe, I felt I was knowing something about India. Yeah, very, very little. Now I'm starting learning much more. Meeting you guys, going around the streets, etc., etc. You know, I'm sure, very little about Italy. Yes. And we all, of course, follow stereotypes. So, in order to know our culture more and more, of course, we have to study, we have to uh, expand our knowledge, but also we have to interact. And it's in this action, interacting, that actually art, music, can help us to accelerate this process of, um, of knowledge of each other. Music can really accelerate uh, this, this transfer of knowledge. Uh, how? Well, you know, if now I'm going to play a piece on a piano, it doesn't matter if you know the composer, you don't, you know, you don't like the melody, but something will happen. You won't like it, you will like the melody, but you will, you know, interpret the melody, the language, directly. Because there is no direct meaning of the words, of course, related to music or to a, a painting or, or to dance, right? Those languages can transfer directly emotions, feelings. But what about if we use those kind of languages to transfer values, to transfer ideas, common ideas? Well, the result is, is amazing, you know? And I've been experiencing this over the last years, and that's why I've created, three, four years ago, an international organization for the promotion of music diplomacy. So I, I actually called many musicians all around the world, even from India, to say, guys, we have a mission, we have a duty, which is not just playing in concert hall or in theaters. We can actually use this language, and you artists, we can use your visibility to transfer to the society also some values, global values. And so that's why we started organizing concerts and workshops all around the world, bringing together artists from different countries, meeting always young people like you, and start interacting, first using music, but music is just you know, a gateway. As they were saying before, speakers before me, you know, we have to access this gateway. Peace is just a result of a series of actions. It might be playing the violin, it might be playing a, a sport match, it might be developing a software or work in the bank. It doesn't matter, we all have a role here. No, we are, I always think, we are like an orchestra, right? You guys right now are an orchestra. Here we have a section, another section, another section. An orchestra works well, why? Because everyone is different in the orchestra, we are different persons, different musicians, different personal life stories. We play different music instruments, but we agree on specific rules that will put us in the conditions to play together and to create beauty and to be in harmony between us. Society is the same thing, guys. Society is a big orchestra. Sometimes it's a very unprofessional orchestra, let's say, right? So we have doctors, we have politicians, we have engineers. We do have to find harmony between all the different sections of society so that we can be a beautiful orchestra. And this is true also on a global level. If India, we think like India is a musician, beautiful musician, you play a wonderful music, which is your culture, your tradition, your vision of the world. But if you play just for yourself in a, in a corner and you say, I am the best player in the world, 
you will not actually, you know, create beauty, create pos positiveness in the world. If India start playing, you know, in harmony with the other instruments, so with the other countries, this is peace, this is music diplomacy. So music diplomacy also is not just playing music, it's also understanding the basics of music and transfer them to other kind of actions. So to conclude, uh, I didn't came here just to, you know, speak for 10 minutes. This is too easy, right? And you are getting tired already. We have a challenge, you know? It's, it's up to me, also it's up to some of you to take this opportunity that we are here together and try to join forces. Maybe it's not going to happen this day, maybe it's going to happen another day, but we have an opportunity to join forces. In which way? I don't know. But, you know, we can, if we feel something, we may try to do something. I, I'm based in Italy. I might be a good connection for you in Italy. You might be a good connection for me in India. Of course, there is a trust who facilitated my, my visit here. And through this trust, we are going to, to promote more, more projects, hopefully, in the near future. Just to conclude, the word about the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates, the other organization I work with. World Summit Nobel Peace Laureates is a platform that brings together Nobel Peace Laureates um, individuals and organization every year for one summit. So it's an annual conference that brings together these enlightened people and organizations to send out a message to the world. Nobel Peace Laureates are normal persons. You know, I'm always saying like, uh, there might be a Nobel Peace Laureates also in this audience. One day, you know, one day, one of you can make a change with, which will become visible to the rest of the world. So we really have to think that each of us can make such kind of high-level change in the world. Well, the World Summit on Nobel Peace Laureates, is, this is the, the meaning of the summit, to just send out a message to the world saying, you know, we as individual laureates, we made the change. This is not enough. We have to bring together, we have to come together because challenges are becoming global challenges. It's not just about anymore about the challenge of India, the challenge of Italy. Solutions, sustainable solutions has to be found together. So with the summit of Nobel Peace Laureates, we are hopefully uh, expanding collaborations also with Indian organizations. And this is what we are discussing also during these days. And I will be very pleased if we are going to create the conditions also for you to join the next summit. Every year, more than 2,000 students from all over, the world, all over the world join the summit to meet not only the Nobel Peace Laureates, but especially to meet young, other young people coming from other places of the world with the same vision, with the same ambition to make a positive impact in our societies and communities. So this is it. This is part of my story. I, I really hope this will be just the beginning of a friendship and of a collaboration with you, your school, uh, your community. And I'm very looking forward to, to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would like to call on DICE student manager Nidhi Singh to introduce our honorable guest, Dr. Edward Muller, Founder and President of University for International Cooperation to All. Good afternoon, one and all. I am deeply honored to have the golden opportunity to introduce Dr. Edward Muller. He is born in Costa Rica. He is a citizen of Costa Rica and Germany. Has lived for long periods in Costa Rica, Germany, and Brazil, and has visited over 80 countries. He is the founder and president of the University for International Cooperation since 1994. He is a world leader in regenerative development, a holistic approach where they produce and conserve, thus maximizing the ecosystem function. At UCI, he is a chairholder of the UNESCO Chair for Biosphere Reserves and Natural and Mixed World Heritage Sites. He coordinates several projects on climate change, biosphere reserves, protected areas, local rural development, poverty, and conservation. 
He has worked in sustainable development, sustainable tourism, eco and agro ecotourism. He has worked he has worked as a consultant for G GTZ, GIZ, UNDP, World Bank, UNESCO, MEB, and World Heritage, and many such renowned organizations. He has done his graduate studies in veterinary medicine and doctorate with emphasis on animal reproduction and hygiene at the School of Veterinary Medicine of Hanover, Hanover, Germany, where he obtained title Doctor Medicine Veterinary and Off Bosch Stadium Diploma in 1985. On behalf of Sri Balaji Society, it's an immense, immense pleasure to invite Dr. Edward Muller to address the future managers of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. It has been a very inspiring moment, a very inspiring morning. Um, I'm sorry I'm going to give you the back, but I'm with students. So I'm turning into a teacher right now. Um, I want to ask you one question. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to open your eyes very wide. Who of you wants to be a politician? One? Anybody else? Two? Three? Four? Five? Six? How many political appointments are available in India? Six? If you leave your future to gray-haired people like me, you have no future. You have to take the future in your hands. And this is something you have to wake up to today, not in five or ten years. Let me see if I get the presentation running. Okay, so I'm going to go through where we are now in terms of the planetary development, and then I'm going to go to some of the solutions with you. We're actually in a historical moment of our society. Our civilization is in a historical moment. We're in a moment of change. We're starting to see rapid change in many, many fields. Actually, Trump's election, which we all thought would be very bad, is actually very good. It's good because it's bringing the rest of the people of the planet together. It's bringing us to realize that <laughs> that establishment, which is represented by him, has ruled the world in a way that has concentrated everything, power, money, in such few hands and the only way to actually reverse this process is if we start working together. How is our culture? Our culture is what defines us. It makes me different than you. It makes us in Costa Rica different than the Brazilians and the Germans. But our culture is being washed out by superficial things. We have exceptions, but in general terms, our society is more worried with the silicone implants of this actress than with what's happening with our neighbors. We need to recover culture. Culture is the glue of our society. It is what makes us value families, value our towns, value our people. We, we've come to a point where we actually are not self-critics. We don't analyze our own selves, our own life. I'll just give you one example of something we use every day. You know how much of the gasoline actually goes to move the driver? And this is not working very well. Let's see. If, yes. Only a very small percentage of the gasoline we use every day moves the driver. 99.4% moves the ego of that driver. 
we have to value things differently. When we go to the supermarket and buy things, in my country, I have products from all over the world, but we're not aware what it means to consume. This pizza in South Africa, and that's because the, the, the paper was published there, has 80,000 kilometers of carbon footprint of its ingredients. We're so used to having everything in our hands that we don't actually think about what this means in terms of our current global situation. Is this really prosperity? Is this happiness? And all of this consumption ends up as garbage. We're in a linear system from extraction to garbage. Our oceans are being filled as a garbage can. Our life is dying away because of plastics, because of things we use only once or twice or three times. Things we buy already have built in a programmed obsolescence. Things don't last anymore as they used to. I have shirts which are maybe a month old and shirts that are 30 years old. But five-year-old shirts, they don't exist anymore. They don't last anymore as they used to be before. Yeah? Electrical appliances, they used to li last a lifetime. Now they last one or two years and we have to change them. This is planned by the industry. We're actually now in the middle of the sixth planetary extinction. Our planet is disappearing. The paradox is we have more knowledge and more information to know why we're going extinct. We don't need any more information to make decisions. But we have not, or we have actually forgotten to transform information into knowledge and knowledge into wisdom. Why? Because we don't go into the silence anymore and think and analyze. We're just living very quickly and not having time to really absorb all of this knowledge into smart decision making. We're actually in a process where the unpredictable, the unimaginable future is already here. These huge migrations that are coming now from Africa to Europe, even throughout our own continents that we're looking at. This is due to a planet that has been hurt. Climate change is the cause for these migrations from Syria to Europe. It's not because there's a, pol a political problem there with a politician that's supported by the Russians and the Contra supported by the US. These people suffered from severe drought and had to move into the city demanding services. Right now, in our planet, tens of millions of people are on the verge of starvation because of planetary destruction. And we're not changing our lives. We're keeping on like if nothing was happening. Actually, the more scarce the resources get, the less chance there is for peace. Conflict over scarce resources is exactly the opposite of peace. One question, can we still achieve sustainable development? The United Nations just launched the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, two years ago. Is it still possible to, to achieve sustainable development? Yes? Okay, I'll ask the question later on. How is the Earth health? Let, let's have a look at what our planetary stage is now. Okay. There's a very interesting approach that's being used by lots of scientists now. It's called the planetary boundaries. And basically, it's a safe operating space for humanity. So if we actually can do things within that one planet, we are safe. And all of these factors are global change. Climate change is one of them. If I ask you which is the most important one, what do you say? Of these changes all done by humans to our planet. We have four areas where we've gone way over the planetary boundaries, the safe limits for humanity to operate. 
Boxier integrity, loss of biodiversity is number one cause for planetary extinction. Loss of biodiversity. The second one is use of fertilizers. We've come to believe the chemical companies that subsidize the universities that train people to sell chemical products. And we think we can only produce food with chemical products. And these chemical products are killing our planet even more than climate change today. I was born in a very diverse country, like India. Mariela said, 5% of the world's biodiversity. And in a region, Latin America, which is very diverse in culture. And in this culture diversity is the knowledge we need to look for new answers in a changing planet. So we need to hang on to this culture to be able to find answers to all these challenges we're facing. The kid on the left, he was three and a half years old there. He looks like this now. He was my old, he's my oldest son. On the right is my youngest son. He's only five. When I take my youngest son to National Park, and there's the trail of a National Park, he has the right to see only half the life of his older brother. 50% of life is gone in my country. Who's to blame? Me. I turn on the car key every single morning. I'm part of the problem. We have scientific reports, as I said, that give us more information than we would need to save the planet. Right now, almost two-thirds of the planet, the Earth, the land surface of the planet, has biodiversity levels below what we consider safe limits. That means that ecosystems are not functioning to support life, even our life, in two-thirds of the terrestrial part of the planet. And our academics, our politicians, are still worried about economic problems. This ecological recession is a one-way street. We cannot reinvent life. So we need to really think what we're going to do forward. The big biomes are dying. The Amazon is going to be gone within the next century. 40 or 60 percent of it will be turned into savanna instead of a tropical rainforest in your lifetime, maybe before you even get to my age. That's the rapid change we're seeing. The coral reefs of the world, they're dying. 50% died last year of the Great Barrier Reef. Another 30% is dying this year. And we still keep on living as if nothing were happening. We're not changing our lifestyles. We're not changing our consumption patterns. We have lots of answers internationally the CBD, I was in this meeting in Nagoya, 21 days negotiating, another 10 years. We just kicked the ball forward another 10 years. By 2020, we'd stop biodiversity loss. We have three years to go, and we're not there yet. We had promised to do that by 2010. We didn't do it. Now, countries said, well, we don't know how to do it. So we developed 20 targets. One of them is by 2020, in three years, our governments our businesses would have the value of biodiversity built into the business plans. I'm not sure if in this country, I know in my country it isn't, in three years we'll have that national accounting of biodiversity and ecosystem values built into the national economy and decision making, built into the companies. Let's look at agriculture. As I said, they made us believe that we needed chemicals to produce. We're actually destroying our livelihoods. In Costa Rica, a green country, we increased chemicals 328% in those years. And our productivity has decreased. So our crops are actually producing less with more chemicals. And our farmers are paying 60 or 70% of what they gain to chemical companies. Our professionals in agriculture have been mistrained as chemical salesmen and not supporting life to produce food. And we're getting to a point where many millions of us are already having problems to get 
good food. In our region, the countries already know that by 2050 or 2060, they won't be producing the food they have to eat because of climate change, because of soil degradation, because of global change. We're just flooded with chemicals. All our diseases, cancer, all these diseases that are coming up are due to this wrong direction of our agriculture. Even the European parliamentarians that approved another seven years for Monsanto, they tested positive with 17 times the level of glyphosate in their urine than what is allowed in drinkable water in Europe. And what did they do? Yeah, they didn't give Monsanto 15 years. They gave him seven years. How do you approve this type of thing without there being a tremendous amount of corruption in the whole scientific and political process? Corruption. If I'm poisoned, I don't allow that company to keep on poisoning me and my kids. Something must have happened that they renewed these permits. And what we have is a vision that our planet will not keep on producing the food we need. Climate change. I was born in 1958, the year climate change started being measured in amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And those are all the international meetings we've had to reduce the amount of CO2 that we're putting out into the atmosphere. Can you tell me which of those meetings was successful? Paris. Paris was successful. Why? Countries said they were responsible and countries committed to reducing emissions. Each country promised re emission reductions. Okay. What countries promise is the red 3.5 degrees centigrade. So if we manage to have all countries get to 100% of what they promised in emission reductions, we're still in dangerous climate change. So we need to go beyond. Only five countries were green. Only five countries promised what had to be promised. Costa Rica is one of them. <laughs> the whole thing is changing. I won't go too long into detail because I don't have enough time. But we're just looking around, standing, seeing how our planet disintegrates, see how the sea level is rising, see how temperatures go to extremes. See how year after year we're getting new records of temperatures with 2016 having jumped a tremendous amount compared to the previous years. We're actually looking at levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that I never dreamed of talking about when I started talking about global change 30 years ago. I never thought I'd be talking about 400 parts per million. We're there already, okay? You have experiences in your country. Last year we saw all this news about India in 50 degrees centigrade. I don't know how you can live under those temperatures. I don't know how food can be produced under those temperatures. And then floodings. This is the typical things of climate change. We were hit by a hurricane for the first time in modern history in Costa Rica last December. We never had hurricanes before. We're getting to a point that we have to really think of what we're accepting as a society. I'll just give you one example. Yogurt is healthy food, right? Have you looked at the labels? I don't know what you eat here in the supermarkets, but if you look at a label of yogurt in the United States, that's what you get. They're selling you poison. And we accept it. Who looks at labels when you buy everything? Good. Good. Candy for kids with titanium dioxide added to it. This is corruption. Okay. How is it, this is supposed to help us all in our economic development, right? We're in an extractive model. We have to go to a circular economy. We cannot keep on concentrating all the wealth in the hands of less than 1% of humanity. This is wrong. This is what business schools teach us. This is not the way to go. Okay. We need to move to a different society. We need to move to a society that reconnects with the Mother Earth. Businesses that reconnect with Mother Earth. A business cannot
do damage or minimize damage. It has to increase wellness of the environment, of the communities. Environmental impact assessment is part of the corruption. It's a permission to do damage, minimize the damage. But it's like if I give a couple a permit to be slightly unfaithful. It's exactly the same example. This is what an environmental impact assessment has. We have to go from the ego economy where man is on top, the woman is underneath, and the rest of life is underneath, to an eco-economy, to an eco-society. Solutions. The best solution is regenerative development. And this is a holistic approach with six layers, where we go from environment to society to economics to culture to politics and spirituality. Problem is academics and the academy, the universities, don't build spirituality into their programs. A business program should have as the core the spiritual component, not the economical component. This has to change. And it's dynamic. Change is permanent now. Change is not the exception as it used to be. Now we're facing permanent change. So we have to develop strategies to learn permanently and start imitating nature in how to develop differently. So how are we going to do holistic approaches if our universities are divided in faculties, in departments, and somebody with a postdoc is so specific, he'll never see the system. He sees a component. He can dissect the component to death, literally, without understanding the system. We're not educated to see interactions. Our faculties are not built to study interactions. So we need to move into a different paradigm of education. So these layers have to be looked upon under holistic approaches. And how can we do that? How do we regenerate our academy so we can sit different professionals on a table and have a common language and not have to speak about soccer or something else? Because we don't have that common language. How do we train our teachers at the business schools not to go with a traditional model of having one person succeed, the best grade? There's no relationship between a good professional and the grading system of a university. There's no relation of a good human being with the grading system of a high school. That's wrong. So we need to measure success as a community, going from me to us. The result of a business plan should be going from me to us as a community. We need to go from the clusters, the famous clusters from Harvard University, to co-creation, to co-generating new knowledge, new ways to face life. A dynamic process. You all use Facebook, right? Okay. Let's go beyond share and like and actually read what we're sharing. Build together a community of learning. We need to move forward from teaching knowledge, which is in our cell phone today. And one of the things I have problems with my teachers at the university is I don't want them to teach. They're not the owners of knowledge. They're facilitators of a learning process for young people like you. So a teacher should not be the wealth owner, wealthy owner of knowledge. He should be a humble facilitator to tell you where you find the knowledge you need to build your own wisdom. And for that, you need to work with your heart. You need to go from knowing to actually knowing how to be. To be. Cleaning up starts at home. Cleaning those oceans that are full of plastic starts at our home. They don't start with a municipal order or a garbage collector. They start by not buying things that we're going to throw away. And the moment you stop buying things that you have to throw away, they'll start producing them. But as long as we keep on buying the last model of the new eye, they'll keep on producing new eyes. So it's our turn to act. We need this new leadership. We need new political leadership. You have to be 
politicians. You have to help make decisions. You have to control your own life. Democracy is not voting. <laughs> we have a, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. We have a, a new initiative. We've done some pilot projects and it works by training youth to be politicians. We're going to go through global change and knowing where we are, not looking to the side. We're going to go through policy, politics, leadership, governance, conflict management, and have also tools. How do I use social networking to make change? How do I bring students together? How do I start making a whole global network of youth to throw down all these gray-haired, corrupt politicians. You have to do it. We'll be helping you, but you have to do it. We need to learn by doing. We need you to start going beyond receiving information and producing information, co-creating new solutions for your life. Because our challenges with global change are not going to be solved by numbers by economics. They're going to be solved by a new paradigm. We need peace with nature and we need peace amongst us. We will not be able to get peace amongst us if we have this war with nature. And our planet has a fever. And why do we get fevers? Because with an increase in our body temperature, the viruses and the bacteria cannot reproduce very well. So why is the planet getting fever? because it has a tremendous parasite living on it and it's going to get rid of us if we don't start taking care. Nature does not need us. We need nature. Environmental education is not humans here and nature there and let me plant a tree and save the world. No, I depend on that nature to live and I have to reverence it and look at how I can make it healthier. It's our time to make a change. Who of you have read the Earth Charter? Google it up. You're good at Googling, right? Earth Charter. It's very short. If you can follow those principles on your daily life, you'll become better humans. So we have to decide now if we want to be for longer on this planet or not. It's our decision right now. Not in five years, not in ten years. It's your decision if you want to keep on living on this planet. The way it is, my five-year-old won't get to how I used to live by the time he gets to my age. I don't know if it will be a nice planet to live. And that's why I do this, what I do. I need him to come back to me and say, thanks for having tried. I hope he can say, thanks for having accomplished something. But I don't want him to say, what the hell were you thinking about? Wasting my future while you had fun. And now I don't have a planet to live. And that is our responsibility. I hope we are remembered by the generation that managed to change our civilization into something prosper. Something where gross domestic product, which is a corrupt measurement of economics, will be changed by happiness by well-being, by peace. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to request Mr. Vradhan Chandar, Senior Trustee, Sri Ramanuja Mission Trust, to address us budding student managers. Srimate Ramanuja Namaha. It's our greatest pleasure to be here amongst you from Sri Ramanuja Mission Trust and addressing such an inspiring and enthusiastic group or our section of the youth of the country. I was telling your director, Sri Bala Subramanyam, how impressed I am of the discipline and the patience of the st students as we, there was a, an unavoidable delay in the commencement of uh, this particular program. I also was sharing with him my impression 
on about this institute and the students here on a relative scale as we have been traveling. As you are aware, Ramanuja Mission Trust has been existing for the last 17 years, founded by Chaturvedi Swami, mainly in the working in the area of peace campaign among the youth of the country as well as across the world. And on behalf of the trust, I've been traveling across the world. We have traveled to many universities, many institutions, and I was telling your director that this institute has the potential to rise to the one of the outstanding institute of international caliber as what you see in Berlin, what you see in London, or what you see in Boston, or what you see in San Francisco, Stanford, Harvard, or this, 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 this institute has the potential to become an international institute, and each of you shine, will be able to shine to the extent of competing with the international levels. And all that is required is certain amount of refinement, certain articulation to the needs and requirements of the time today. And we would like to have a social experiment along with such bright and, and, and very, very energetic youth of people to try and see what are the differences we can do, how differently we can do, how, what, what are the changes we can do in our approaches in resolving some of the major challenging problems that we have facing us. The, the, the seriousness of the problems which are facing us are extremely high. And Dr. Edward Muller, I met him about four months back when I had been to Costa Rica, impressed me immediately as a person who needs to be brought to India and we need to work along with him. The, the, the type of vision, the type of alarm, the type of concern that he has for Mother Earth and the, the, the clarity and the vision that he has for the changes that are required are very much in line with what our own Swamiji has been telling uh, for the last 15 years. In Dr. Edward, we have uh, an excellent mentor who will be able to work along with us in some of these aspects. And very briefly, I want to tell about what SRMT stands for. Chaturvedi Swami has been doing this particular campaign for change management in the minds and attitudes of people across the, especially the youth section, and mainly to motivate inside all of us, we have two types of mental attitudes. One is the divine core and the other is the animal core. How do you strengthen, align yourself, the mind, the activity and action to the divine core and imbibe those qualities of divinity, especially love, sympathy, compassion and forgiveness. These are four essential qualities of divinity. How each one of us can identify the two different levels, one at a higher level which can take us up to the spiritual level, other at the brutal level, the animal level with the greed, selfishness, and the fear and insecurity that will pull you down. Most of the problems that we have today confronting humanity is that is the power and authority, the corporate power or the political power across the governments and corporates across the world or in the hands of few thousands of people who are unfortunately in the lower level, who are subject to yielding themselves to the greed, selfishness, and the brutal qualities, which is causing the lot of suffering to vast millions of world. So we need to have an emergence and a generation of new leadership which is spiritual in nature, which has care and concern, sympathy and compassion, as well as forgiveness towards all people to be able to resolve all conflicts and all programs, all, all, all differences and take humanity to a level, higher level. We have had 20th century, a lot of tensions, a lot of problems. This 21st century ought to be a century of peace and harmony and justice and sustainability. These are the four values which ought to be the guiding principles on which every policy and every principle of every government and uh, mankind is directed towards. How do we evolve? How do we emerge that type of new relationship which can get charge the control of this? You can't say it's already problems exist. We are wringing our hands and remain helpless about it. We can't do that. We need to take new initiatives, innovative ways of approach. Swamiji has been guiding on this type of innovative approaches of overcoming, surmounting these challenging problems. And one of this is to energize, inspire, activate the minds of the youngsters who are the pillars of the future of mankind and future of this country, all of you here. And it is this intention in mind, Swami has been inviting international experts. We have invited about 40 to 50 international experts in the last five years, carrying out campaigns across the educational institutions calling them Grand Global Peace Meets. This is also one of those constituents of the Grand Global Peace Meet, where we are able to inspire 
bringing the best of the speakers from abroad and trying to tell the children or the youth what the changes are needed, how they could get charged on this. And, and to be able to institutionalize, to be able to have an organized manner, we, we are trying to evolve a new set of setup known as International Peace Corps. You heard about International Red Cross, you heard about Lions International, you heard about Rotary International. In India, we have National Cadet Corps, National Service Schemes. These are all non governmental organizations, institutions, people oriented institutions. If you have governments and the United Nations, which is representing those governments, those governments are controlled by vested interests and who are interested in perpetuating the stakeholders who are interested in continuing the existing trend of things. They don't want to disturb the apple cart. But the trend is negative. The way things are going, are, nobody has any control of the, how the things are going, and each one is looking at it in a very, very blinkered way, like the horses, and only to that extent they see, and the overall holistic manner in which all changes are to be required. It's not in the vision or in the things. And the, the backseat driving, driving of the government being done by the interested lobbies, who have a vested interest in continuing. The few thousands of people who, have, who are driven by their own greed, selfishness, and their own self-interest of bottom line and profitability. If such people are given power and authority, they will only deny. Where is the problem? Let me withdraw from Paris. Well, who says all this climate change is bunkum? This is what they will be saying. It is for us to assert, no, sorry, we are not going to be driven. We know we, the, there are data, all Proof can be done on the basis of data. We have enough data to, in, in, to, to point out so much of damage is being caused to the environment today and the armament industry. There are two major areas where peace is to be established by controlling the armament industry on the one hand and controlling the chemical and the telecommunication industry on the other. These are the two industries which are in the hands of very, a few thousands of very, very misguiding type of people which is causing enormous harm to the very existence of mankind. And this needs to be the awareness about the seriousness of the issue and the corrective actions that are required for doing it has to be understood correctly. It is from this angle that we are telling you. On environment, when we talk about, there's one simple instance I would like to come bring to your mind, which is causing a lot of pain and agony to my heart. We used to love sparrows. We used to love squirrels. The last 10 years of the increase in the microwave transmission towers for all our cell phones, we are demanding the companies, I want more charge, I'm not able to hear. I want more power, and they are pumping more and more microwaves across the towers. All these microwaves are causing such a big harm. The whole sparrows, the tiny little beautiful sparrows that we have in the backyard, they've completely disappeared in our own. We are standing witness. All of us, how many of you remember the good old days where we had our own houses, backyards, trees, having sparrows, their nests? They've disappeared. Squirrels have disappeared. The brains of these tiny little beautiful animals have completely gone because of the microwave transmission. I'm wondering what happens to our own children, the fetus in our own uh, ladies at that age uh, when they are just farming, three weeks, 10 weeks, 15 weeks. If this can harm the brains of the sparrows and squirrels, won't they harm the fetus when it is being farmed? The consequence of this we will know after 10 years, 20 years. You know about the drug known as thalidomide, which was found for morning sickness for the pregnant women to overcome the nausea during carrying days. The, the consequence of this drug was known after four, three years, four years, when the children were born without limbs, so much of damage. We had had Minamata disease, so much of mercury pollution, creating a new generation of children in Japan who were having serious deformities. The consequences of such action is silently swept under the carpet. We should call them as corporate criminals, people who make money out of this type of damaging the environment and pull them by the collar, bring them to the street, punish them. They are anti-humanity criminals. The corporate criminals and the political governments which are supporting them, are shielding them, are getting corrupted, uh, by taking the money and allowing them to do series, the silent, innocent thousands and who are being, suffering of that. We need to stand up on behalf of representing those innocent who, who have no right to be damaged like this. Each one of you must get charged up. Each one of you must get angry. You must get upset. This is known as moral outrage. These are known as, I'm not going to allow this. This is nonsense. A few individuals cannot take the whole humanity to ransom like this. That type of resolve and determination and a firm resolve must come in the minds of every right-thinking, caring, concerning, loving, compassionate citizen of this earth. And to institutionalize this, we want to have international peace score. And we want to have the, the group of Nobel Peace Laureates 
we have, fortunately we have a body in Rome, our Paolo Petroselli represents this particular thing. All the peace lobbies of the world, peace activists, peace champions of the world who have been here for the last 20 years are here, assembled. They have been meeting every year. We would like to have all those Nobel Peace Laureates to be the chartered founding members of International Peace Corps and the youth of the world will be members of it. And they will be championing, they will be causing uh, this particular change. And we would like to have your institution, your type of institution, which is having so much of discipline, commitment and dedication, thanks to your management. Most of your um, staff are from the military, from the discipline. You know, good, one day a good general can be a good soldier, they say. The type of military training, the, the services, the skill, the qualities of mind which they have got, the hard work, dedication, discipline, commitment, the patriotism, all those values which they have imbibed, knowingly or unknowingly, they've been able to imbibe into all of you. Such type of model institutions is where we would like to commence our experiment on trying to do something about it. And, and we plan to do it in the next year, year after. We will come and meet you and interact with all of you for incorporation in this type of services further. Next thing is evolving a new leadership, one for environmental care, qualified leadership, skilled leadership, one for environmental care, like what Dr. Edward was mentioning. We need to have global change managers. Agents of change are required. Environmental change managers on the one hand, and social, peace related, people related issues are also important. So we'd like to have a, a new type of management syllabus. This is our demands of the time. There is no existing education syllabuses are all job oriented, skill oriented, employment oriented, salary oriented. Fine, very good, we don't deny that. But the needs of the society are of different type of new leaders, new thought, thought providers, new action oriented youth, who are well trained and skilled. We would like to have amongst the people oriented thing. We are, we are tying up with institutions. We are, we are just floating with the great psychologist based in Delhi called Dr. Sunil Saini to have new type of orientation of education on peace methodologies, management courses on peace methodologies, training youngsters on conflict resolution, stress management, mind management, counseling skills, negotiation skills, and these are the, some of the courses we would like to have, and have a new series of people. And in, on environmental care, we would, like, we would like to have responsible care, environmental care methodologies, management courses. And then expose those criminals, those from the chemical industry, those from the telecommunication industry, what is the unsustainable, dangerous actions that they are doing, how the way the rivers are getting polluted. You know, when, if you want to see blue whale any longer, I, I suggest all of you to immediately travel to the US. I'm sorry, but I had this experience, I have to tell you. And watch those blue whales beautifully coming from Mexico right up to the Monterey. Uh, and then just south of San Francisco, you have series of about eight, nine beautiful whales coming, going down and sucking and picking, uh, eating those planktons which are available only at that place, nowhere else. So they travel all the way from Mexico, come, eat and go. And the, 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 the washnologist guide who was taking us was telling, you, this will be there only for the next 10 years because the, the rate at which the rapid deterioration of the planktons which for, for eating which these whales are coming are re uh, degenerating very, very, at a very fast rate. So another five to 10 years, all this will disappear because of the excessive acidity of the soil. Even Bay of Bengal, we used to have a lot of sharks. Aduar was telling me last night that because of excessive chemicals which are used by the Indian farmers, far higher than or who others are using, all the chemicals from the river, this, from our soil has gone to the river, all the water has gone to Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. The acidification of this sea uh, surrounding India has gone so high, it is already started, uh, damaging most of the algae. And because algae is the food, the food cycle is damaged. So eating which all the fish and other things used to survive, they are all disappearing. And uh, you know, on this time we have to remember one major fact. India used to be a country which worshipped cow. We don't want to look at cow from a religious angle, sorry. That's only a small section of people. The cows and the bulls and the buffaloes are required today for organic farming as a very important essential raw material suppliers. Because all those, our farmers used to get per acre 40 to 50 bags of paddy earlier. Now they're getting only 15 to 20 bags. There's a rapid deterioration in the output of the agricultural income of our farmers in the last 20 years because of the excessive use of pesticides, phosphorodiathioids, organic sulfur-based compounds. And then all your manev, zainev, the fungicides, the, the, the atrazine, simazine, 
the type of herbicides that we use. And then urea, excessive nitrates, excessive potassium. You know why? All the corporate criminals, the so-called multinationals who are in the agro agrochemical industry or fertilizer industry are giving liberal discounts, liberal margins, liberal commissions to the dealers, distributors, wholesalers and retailers. They go and dump it. And far beyond the needs of the for soil, all these chemicals are being dumped in the Indian soil, which is degenerated, is completely spoiled the output of the farmers. And the rapid fall in the output in the last 20 years has been because of the excessive dumping of soil, which has already taken place. And all of, you are, all of us are witnesses to the suicides that's taking place in Maharashtra, Andhra, now in Tamil Nadu, in other states. Why? India is a very rich, prosperous country. We have been traditionally farming, following organic farming for thousands of years. Why our farmers are now having a situation where the farm output has gone so down? The, the financial loan that they took for buying the thing, buying the chemicals, we have not been able to do. And they are very self-respecting people. They would rather die rather than face this type of humiliation. The native, the, this, this particular sad consequence is because of the wrong policies of the corrupt politicians and the corrupt businessmen who are controlling the business decisions in the last so many years. All this need correction. All this need to be corrected. Organic farming is required today. And cows have to be, should not be killed for beef purposes, should not be banned for any other purposes. They, even if they don't give milk, cow and bull are needed for giving the, the, the natural panchagavya type of their own, earth, the dung and uh, uh, urine. They are the raw material suppliers. We need to rejuvenate, we need to revitalize the lakhs and lakhs of acres of our agricultural land in the next 20 years. We ought to be doing it to save our farmers. For this, the main 50% of the main input for organic farming comes from panchagavya. We need all this to be surviving. They should not be killed and beef export has been increasing in the last so many years. We cannot allow this. We are, we are answerable to our own subsequent generation. You, all of you are answerable to yourself. Um, how can I allow this? Why should I allow this? If such things are happening, how do I correct myself? The fire in the belly for each of you must wake up, must rise and say, I'm not going to allow this. Come what me. That is a type of anger, a moral outrage, a legitimate anger. They call it dharmic kopam. You ought to be having it. And when I look at my own grandchildren, I'm really worried. What's the type of future they are going to have if this is the trend? I'm leaving all these subjects I, and the, the thoughts in, open for you, for you to ponder about. But in terms of, rather than Pete says, uh, helplessly saying, no, let's do something about it. Come, let's get upset. Let's do something about it. Getting upset alone is the way that we are able to do something about it. And each of us have to determine to ourselves, I mean, answerable to ourselves. Let's do something about it. Let this be our career. How do we do? Create change management in environment care. How do we do change management in the so communities care on peace? And, how do, and in this context, I must give a very good example of Costa Rica. Costa Rica is the only country in the world which has got a Ministry of Peace. Ministry of Peace is existing in Costa Rica. I was talking to the minister there. And they have a environmental care which is ideal for us to adopt today. They may be small, but they are very wise. They are very noble. This is a model which we should be adopting. And we need to adopt their model of peace, how they intervene in society. They have peace negotiators, peace counselors, peace reconciliation officers. All of you must take such management courses. We would like to introduce those for the first time in the country and keep them as online courses. Supplement to whatever you are already doing. Please consider con joining this. We will have Dr. Edward as one of our consultants for this particular course. And we would like to do some passive action, action for correction. This will be our this. We will not just helplessly say, no, we cannot do. Well, let's intervene socially. Let's join together. And all like-minded people have to join together. This is a tug of war where the money and the influence are on the other side. Let's all join together. Send them this. The like-minded cooperation of all, of all positive thinking people. When we join together, we can really retrieve the situation out of the of deterioration of the existing condition. I I'm, I'm wish and, and hope that each one of you will come forward to extend the hand of support to us. Thank you. Good afternoon to one and all. I feel privileged on introducing Dr. Nitin Parab, an author, strategist, and evangelist with a mission to harness the potential of human capital by creating new age leaders for nation building, and vision to make India among the top five progressive nations in the world. He has written many articles on leadership 
and few books of which you the leader has been released this may now on behalf of sri balaji society i would like to invite dr nitin parab to share a few words and propose the vote of thanks so the dais is all yours young warriors do you call yourself warriors and peace is your mission you all with me yes. wow now out here we had dr muller a single army with a single mission to talk about saving planet earth and let me take you back towards a particular era 200 years back 200 years back there were farmers and people from the farmland coming into the cities to create what is known as the industrial revolution and during that industrial revolution a sensitive author expresses his view and i am going to quote him he says it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was an era of wisdom it was an era of foolishness it was an epoch of belief it was an epoch of incredibility it was the spring of hope it was the winter of despair two emotions going into the human being 200 years back friends today at the beginning of the digital century we are experiencing similar emotions there is uncertainty all over the air we are moving at the speed of light with technology disrupting our very lives and we are uncertain about our own destiny in these times how do you figure to take the journey how do you enjoy this beautiful journey called life and how do you look at our planet as the planet that will take care of the future generations these are questions when you go into your inner mind and you reflect about the world so friends i am going to tell you a few things that needs to be of concern the few things are that we have come a long way we are 700 billion population on planet earth distributed over 200 countries these 200 countries which earlier brought in the concept of borderless world are now caging in to be utterly selfish in their resources of creating wealth only for themselves i would like you to demolish the word called foreigner because we cannot look at foreigners we have to look them uh, look at them as ours when we look at them as our people then we look about a human community being formed for the new world so my friends i will leave just one quote to you one because i am a poet and a writer because these are words that can inspire the very soul written 800 years back by a very evolved poet lives of great men all remind us that we can make our life sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time with this let me bring in the vote of thanks i am very much obliged to professor colonel bala subramaniam i my i have no words for him it was my first meeting when i came all the way from mumbai and i just met him and i said this is the program he says let's go ahead with him such encouragement i had never seen and in the matter of 7 to 8 days we had this program brought into existence and my special thanks goes to professor yeluri who was fully dedicated in creating a team to bring in the vibrations to host our dignified guest who have come all the way from distant lands they are coming here for the first time paolo petrucelli and dr edward muller first time entering indian soil and i hope their stay is a very unforgettable stay and they come to india often as said we would like to tie up with their thought processes and create the young warriors amongst y'all in the new future by the way i call myself peace eco warrior then i would like to thank her excellency who has not only uh, traveling a lot but even with uh, health was on the weaker side she agreed to stay back 
and give her presentation on Costa Rica, welcoming all of you all in this particular beautiful land on planet Earth. Then finally, I would like to uh, bow my head towards my beloved guru, Swami Chaturvedi sir, who has been instrumental in igniting the spark amongst the lakhs of people on planet Earth, trying to awaken in them that this is your planet. There is only one in the universe. This is your Earth, which we need to call her our mother. This is our place where we need to enjoy and make our people together look towards a noble purpose. And this is our destination where we will leave a better planet to the next world. Thank you. Thank you one and all.